In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the glossy material in Octane for Cinema 4D. And for this video, I'm using the Materials 01.C4D scene. And this is the scene that has this little sci-fi structure in the background. And I've got four spheres, so the diffuse material, glossy, specular, and metallic material applied to each sphere here. So we're going to take a look at the glossy material. So the settings that are shared by the glossy material and the diffuse material, I'm going to skip those in this video. So I'm just going to focus on those settings that are unique or important to the glossy material itself. So if you haven't seen the diffuse material movie, I recommend you check that out before watching this one so you're familiar with all the settings. So let's pause this render for a second and move this out of the way. Actually, first I'm going to choose materials. Octane node editor to bring up the node editor. And uh, let's create a new material. So create a new Octane material. Let's call this, I'm gonna choose right click and then choose rename and call it machine glossy. And then I'll select the big bar machine group so that contains all the geometry right here. And I'm going to right click and choose apply to objects. So it's applied to the group. So if we take a look at now, I'm going to unpause this and do a new render. You'll see there's a glossy material applied to the big bar machine. So let's move this up here and we'll select the node editor. expand this a little bit so let's select this material so we can see the settings just like with the diffuse material each of the channels are separated into these groups that you can access by clicking on these buttons so first thing i want to do is go to the basic uh, button right here and the default material type is diffuse so let's set this to glossy doesn't look a whole lot different just yet but we'll get into some of the differences as we go through some of these different settings. So let's go to the diffuse channel, just like with the diffuse material. If I change the color, we can change the color that is reflected back into the environment. But unlike with the diffuse material, you can see as I rotate around here, you can see a little bit of a reflection here. So let's go to the specular channel here, control the amount of specularity by changing the float value, or if I change this to HSV, I can set the value up to increase the reflection. Um, it gets, becomes more apparent when I go to the roughness channel here and I'm going to increase roughness, which will spread out the specular highlight on the surface. There we go. So let's go over here. So you can see as I decrease the roughness, the surface becomes more mirror like as I increase it, the highlight and the reflection is spread out across the surface. So the glossy material is great for smooth, opaque surfaces, things like painted metal or opaque plastic, uh, or let's say a, a wood with a little bit of a shine to it. For those types of surfaces, the glossy material is great. You can also simulate metals with it, although now that we have a metallic material in Octane 308, that usually works better for metal materials. So of course, with the specular and the roughness, you know, in previous versions of Octane for Maya, if you wanted to do like a metallic material, you might actually change the hue of the specular highlight. So if I make this kind of a yellowish hue and I go to the diffuse channel and let's, uh, let's bring the value way down and make this way more orange. So this would be like the old way of creating a metallic surface. You would create a very low diffuse color and then the specular color you would actually tint to a different hue. But like I said, now that we have the metallic material, we don't need to do that so much. But you can also put a texture into the specular channel. Uh, most of the time, it's a good idea to keep this as a white value, especially for things like plastics. That's more realistic. And if you're going to use a texture to break up the highlight on the surface, then you want to add a texture to the roughness channel. So let's do that. So I'm going to go into the texture is here and let's choose image texture and I'm going to select the options here I'm going to, and I'm going to set the type to float. So then let's actually choose an image. So I'll go into the textures for the bar machine textures 
and I'm going to choose Big Bar Machine Rough. And since I'm just doing a demo, I'm going to choose No right here. Uh, so it's not going to copy it to the texture or project directory. Now, of course, we need to hook it up to roughness. So you can see now we're breaking up the roughness and you can see the result right there. It's a little bit more interesting than just a flat color. So we can get a good view. There we go, something like that. So you can see the grayscale value kind of breaking up that roughness. So that's the roughness channel. After roughness, we have anisotropy. Anisotropy is a way to simulate uh, sort of micro grooves on a surface like what you'd see on a brush metal or say like on the surface of a DVD or hair or that kind of thing. Any, any, any type of surface that has um, micro grooves in it that kind of changes or adds a directionality to the specular highlight is considered anisotropic. So let's go back to the roughness channel here and I'm going to clear out this texture. So it's a little bit easier to see what's going on with anisotropy. So I'll select anisotropy here. The default value is zero. So I'll start to increase the anisotropy, but we're not seeing much of a difference yet. So what's going on here? Well, one thing we need to do is let's go to the basic button here, and I'm going to change the BRDF model to Beckman. So the Octane is the default BRDF model, which is very physically based and realistic but Beckman and GGX are even more so. So when you're using anisotropy, you want to choose either Beckman or GGX. So we can see the reflectivity has changed a little bit, but it's kind of hard to see what's going on just yet. So let's go back to anisotropy, and we can change the value here. Let's see if we go back to roughness and increase the roughness to spread out the highlights. So the highlight is a bit more apparent. See if we can get a good view here, uh, something like that. And then we'll go back to anisotropy. And you can see now when I'm adjusting this value, you can see the change. We also have a setting for the rotation. So let's set the anisotropy to a value of like 0.5 around there. And uh, in order to control the rotation, what I can do is I'm going to create a float texture and then connect the float texture to rotation. And now I have a slider which I can use to adjust the rotation of the anisotropy. Let's go in here and play with this a little bit. I'm gonna tighten up that highlight a little bit and then go into rotation and that float value and adjust this. Now we can see it's kind of rotating around. And if I go to the basic tab and instead of Beckman for the BRDF model, I'm I'm going to choose GGX, and you can see that's going to give us a kind of a different style anisotropy as well. So they're just two different reflectance uh, models um, in computer graphics that will give you different results depending on what you're trying to do. Now, the other cool thing about rotation, I've just added a float texture, but you could actually use an image texture. So I'll create an image texture, and in the options for the image texture, I'm going to set the type to float. And let's take a look at what would, what would happen if we use that roughness texture for the anisotropic rotation. So I'm gonna choose that roughness texture. Let's choose no here, just because this is a quick demo. And I'll connect this to rotation. And you can see that grayscale, grayscale values, or the values of the texture are controlling the direction of the anisotropy, which is kind of an interesting effect to create. And you could also use a procedural texture to do this. So that's kind of cool. Uh, let's break this. And I'm going to go back to anisotropy and let's set this down to zero. And let's go to roughness and decrease the roughness to make it a little bit shinier. Something like that. And then let's take a look at sheen. So I'm going to go to the sheen layer. And again, we could actually just, we could attach the float texture to the sheen value. And then change the amount of sheen. And what, and what the sheen does is you can see on the parts of the surface that face away from the camera view, we get a lighter color. 
So you can see it can go up and down there. It becomes even more apparent what's going on if I actually create an RGB spectrum node. And let's connect this to Sheen. And I'll make this like a green color. So now you can really see what's going on with the Sheen. Now this is probably not something you'd want to do in order to create realistic results, but it gives you an idea of how Sheen works. And then if I go in here to the Sheen layer, I can change the roughness. So if I increase the roughness, we're going to see more of a spread out of that Sheen. So this could be really useful for doing effects like dust or something like that. So if I actually connect the texture here that I had for roughness, so if I have that roughness texture connected to the sheen channel, you can see how it creates kind of a really cool looking layer of dust or dirt. And then I can go in and actually adjust the roughness itself. So that's a great way to create like an extra layer of dirt or dust. So next let's take a look at film layer. So I'm going to disconnect this texture from sheen. And let's go in here. And I'm going to go to roughness and just decrease this somewhat. And get a few like that, just so we can see the highlight. Let's go to film layer. And as I increase the float value for film, we can see that it's going to actually add kind of a rainbow effect to that specular highlight. We also have a separate index of refraction that we can use to adjust the color. So this is great for kind of, if you're creating interesting effects, like let's say it's a kind of that rainbow kind of color that you see or that iridescence that you see on the surface of like oil or something like that. So if I go to diffuse, I'm gonna set this all the way to black and then go to film layer. And uh, let's connect the that roughness texture to the film width. You can see we get that kind of weird rainbow kind of oily kind of quality and then we can go in here and adjust the index of refraction for the film layer so this is definitely kind of an interesting look so that's film let's disconnect this so the film ior back to one and the float value to zero. Now the bump, normal, and displacement channels work just the same way they do for the diffuse material. And we also have videos devoted to explaining how those work. So I'm gonna skip those channels for now for the glossy material. And let's take a look at opacity. This works the same way as it does for the diffuse material. If I decrease the float value, it disappears. Just wanted to point out that you'll notice that the entire object, including all the reflections, are faded out when you decrease float value. So that's different from transmission or transparency, which you would find in the specular material, not in the glossy material. Transparency, the surface becomes transparent, but the reflections still remain uh, fairly opaque, which is what makes it look transparent, as opposed to just fading it out. And again, the opacity channel is best used if you're using a texture to create kind of a fine edge to a surface like the edge of a leaf or something like that. If you take a look at the index of refraction. The index of refraction for opaque surfaces has a strong influence on in how the surface reflects objects in the scene. So for instance, if I set the index of refraction to one, to one, and let's go to roughness and set roughness to zero, so I'm setting the float value to zero, you can see that we have essentially a mirror surface. If I go to index, anything below one is going to give you the same result. So what you want to do is if I go to 1.01, you can see I get a dramatically different result because now the index of refraction is controlling how the uh, light is reflected off the surface. So as I increase this, if I say 1.1, you can start to see some of those reflections coming in very dim. Let's set this to 1.5, 2.8, 2 2.8, and so on. And if you're trying to simulate a particular type of material, 
you can always go online and take a look, uh, do a Google search for index of refraction of materials. And there are plenty of websites that will give you a complete list of the index of refraction for materials like aluminum or uh, different types of minerals or whatever you might be looking for. So that's how you can find the correct index of refraction for the surface you're trying to simulate. If you're trying to do a metal surface, then you probably want to use the metallic material. It has much more advanced index of refraction options than the glossy material. If you go to the website Pixel and Poly, there's a great list of index of refractions for various materials. And they have everything from ice to argon and so on. That's a great resource. So if we go to the common settings, we'll find that again, we can turn on or off smooth to smooth normal, sort to leave them hard. You can see how that affects this edge right here. If I turn it off, turn smooth on, we get a rounded edge so we don't have that defined angle. So something worth checking out, depending on the type of surface you're trying to replicate. Of course, now with smooth off, we can see there's a little bit of faceting here on this part right here. And just like with the diffused material, we also have a rounded edge. If I set this to 0.01, this allows us to see kind of an edge or a slight bevel without having to add it in the model. Let's go to roughness and increase the roughness a little bit. Just to make it a little bit more apparent what's going on. We'll go back to common, turn on smooth. Let's set the rounded edge radius to point oh five. We can even try point one. You can see how it's kind of rounding out those edges. This is a little bit extreme. So let's go back to point oh two or something like that. That looks kind of nice. So you can see that beveled edge right there. And then of course we go to the editor tab, we can control how the preview is updated, turn on animated preview, then it should update whenever you change a setting. And then under assign, you can see what surfaces the material is assigned to. So that's the basics of working with the glossy material in Octane for Maya.